I am somewhere in the southwest of Turkey. My new friend here is called Gulec Bey, and he weighs a ton. He is a wrestling camel, and I will be leading him into the ring at the biggest camel festival of the year. That is why I'm here. During the rutting season from January to March in Turkey, Iran, Afghanistan and Pakistan, men organize big festivals to allow their camels to wrestle, which is their natural instinct. How did I come to be here? OK, let's start at the beginning. My trip started much further north in Istanbul, a city of a thousand contrasts. Look at the stray dog covered in snow. Nice to meet you. This is my first time in Istanbul, and it's snowing already. It's a kangal. They're sheepdogs. I wasn't expecting to see any in Istanbul. That's a mullet. A mullet. Do you eat it? Yes, we eat it. You eat that? They use worms as bait. The worm is inside this chrysalis. Wow, it's huge. Good luck. Good luck. And they'd rather do that than play video games with their friends? I'd rather fish. We love fishing. And we get to see the sea. It's beautiful. My first birds in Istanbul. Big ships, ferries, small fishing boats, all crossing the Golden Horn, an estuary in the city. They are heading for the Bosphorus Strait, which links the Black Sea in the north and the Sea of Marmara in the south. It is the border between Europe and Asia. I am on the west coast, and opposite lies the east coast of Turkey. OK. I'm on the trail of a guy known as Pigeon Man, a Turk who lives on the rooftops of Istanbul. Pigeon fancying is an ancient tradition in the East. There, you find the first signs of wild pigeon taming, dating back to 3000 BC. I arrive at Pigeon Man's home in the city center. Aladdin? Ah, uh, welcome. I found it. How are you? How are you? I'm Remy. I am Aladdin. What's your name? Remy. Pleased to meet you, Remy. It's great here. You have a fantastic view. Thank you. Thank you very much. A five-star view. Thank you very much. Are all these pigeons yours? These are our pigeons. Right. And how many pigeons do you have here? We have about 200 pigeons. They've got 200 pigeons here. If you want, I can show you. Sure. It's time for their flight. Drat. They're so happy they're going to get to stretch their wings. Pigeons like this have settled here thanks to the breeders, or pigeon fanciers, as they're called. They are bred here and given grain. They have their nests here, so they stay. These pigeons have a very special flying style. They perform somersaults and are known as tumblers. It's a genetic mutation, and they are the pride and joy of breeders. When these pigeons are released, they loop the loop. Shall I? Go ahead. Oh, yeah, that's crazy. Whoa. <laughs> we work hard. We work very hard and then spend an hour or two with the pigeons. Watching them fly and listening to them relaxes us. You listen to them, you know. I would have never have thought that you could keep 200 pigeons in the centre of a city as big as Istanbul. I wanted to meet animal lovers and keepers and breeders in Istanbul. And here, I think I'm in the right place. Yes, welcome. You've come to the right place. They're everywhere. I can take you to the pigeon market. You'll see lots of different breeds. OK, great. I'd like that. Every Sunday, a big pigeon market is held below the ramparts of the old town. In keeping with Eastern traditions, the Turks are passionate about pigeons, and yet these birds are at the heart of a dilemma. Despite the fact that pigeon racing is forbidden by the Prophet, pigeons are still being bred for the sheer pleasure of seeing them fly. Over 100 varieties gather here, each more psychedelic than the next. 
pigeons in a plastic bag, like chips. That's a bango. It has no beak. Crazy. Some of these pigeons literally have no beak. In the West, they're known as collared pigeons. Their beak is so small, thanks to the artificial selection carried out with this breed, that the parent cannot even feed their young. So the young are raised by other pigeons, who can feed them. Their heads are amazing. The tuft at the front is a genetic mutation. The same goes for the feathers on their feet. And if you want the offspring of this pigeon to have feathers on their feet and a tuft, you probably need to mate it with a female who has the same characteristics. That way, the mutant characteristics are reinforced. This is the famous carrier pigeon, the champion flyer. They're the ones you bet on. They are set free and they have to return to their loft as quickly as possible. He's checking out every detail of the plumage to see whether the feathers are in good condition and whether it will be a good flyer. This one costs about a thousand lira. That's a good one, yes? Okay. At 300 euros a pigeon, it had better be a good one. Everyone comes here to trade, take photos and test the flight of any potential purchase. It's an incredible sight. The Turks are a race of pigeon fanciers. This is crazy. There are earrings for pigeons. That's amazing. We found some in Galatasaray colors. That's the football team he supports, so he wants his pigeons to wear those. Not bad. The same thing exists for sheepdogs and fighter camels. There really is a culture of regalia for pets. It's fascinating. Here in Turkey, we are lucky enough to have lots of animals in the city, but there are more and more animals appearing outside the cities too. With the conflicts in Iraq, Syria and Libya, the animals are fleeing to Turkey. You mean, you mean when there is a conflict or a war in a country, the animals flee too? That's right. The bombs frighten the animals away. Right, so they run away from the violence. There are stray cats and dogs all over the city and they all look very healthy. The cats are even nicknamed the Little Sultans of Istanbul. They are fed and housed by locals. This love of cats comes from the legend of the Prophet's cat who allegedly saved Mohammed from a snake attack. These are little houses for cats. They're like camels. This fatty has got fromage blanc in there. I've heard that people even take them to the vet if there's something wrong with them. It's an extraordinary city, populated by humans, dogs, cats, fish and birds. But I have come to Turkey for camel wrestling. To think they used to roam the streets of the old Roman town of Constantinople, founded in 330 AD, and the Greek town of Byzantium before it. I'm sure to find a trace. My quest has brought me to Sultanahmet, the most famous neighborhood in the city, home to palaces and mosques. The camels must have left a footprint here. Next stop, Hagia Sophia and the Mosaic Museum. It's the call to prayer, that's the museum calling. We're here in front of the Blue Mosque, and just next to it is Hagia Sophia. It's as if the two museums are calling out to one another. sharpening his knife to the sound of the museums of the Blue Mosque and Hagia Sophia. This is insane. Gosh, it's high up. On these famous seven and a half metre wide medallions adorning the columns, the names of Allah, Muhammad and various sultans are inscribed. And these huge discs are made from camel skin, or rather several skins sewn together. So it would have taken a whole herd of camels to make these eight medallions. Oh right, I get it. This is a mosaic museum, so there are mosaics everywhere. 
I'm going to look for links between humans and animals here in Istanbul. In fact, I'm going to try to meet some people in the south of the country who still keep camels for wrestling. Like this? Amazing. <laughs> Historically, our country was on the Silk Route. Right. And the goods were carried along the route by camels. Mm. Okay. Right, because I heard that camels are still active in the south. Do you know anything about that? Yes, you still get camel wrestling along the Aegean coast of Turkey. Right. So is that in the southwest? It's in the west, by the Aegean Sea. OK, great. Thank you for talking to me. You're welcome. I'm going to continue with my adventure. So I'm heading south to watch some camel wrestling. The most famous fights take place in Selçuk. The inhabitants of the Aegean coast have cultivated this tradition which they inherited from nomads. It's the pride and joy of the region. Turgul, my contact, is going to find me a camel driver who is planning to go to Selçuk. So, have you managed to find me someone who does camel wrestling? Who can put me up and show me the... Yes. Yes, it wasn't easy, but I found someone. You have? That's fantastic. Yes. He's... he's going to... he's planning to take his camel to the fight. The family is descended from Yoruks. That's brilliant. And I can stay with him? I think so, because he's very... oh... How can I put it? Enthusiastic? He seemed enthusiastic. Pleased? Yes, he is very pleased. You put this on here, and then you have a look. Like this. Right, what do I see in your fortune? I see a camel. You see a camel? Yes. Amazing. <laughs> That's your fortune this week. Yes, look. Yes. There's a head and... There's the hump. Sergul introduces me to her friends, who are all surprised by the purpose of my trip. I tell them I can't wait to head south to see my first camel. The next day, I leave the capital. This is the best place to explain what a wild trip is. My idea is to take advantage of the fact that sometimes civilization comes into contact with nature. As I leave the city, I want to explore that wild, sometimes hostile world. Instead of fearing nature, let's go and play in it. Let's observe it, demystify it, discover it and admire its riches. I'm crossing the strait which separates Europe from Asia. A long trek through the mountains awaits me. My destination is the city of Bursa, the silk capital of Turkey. Thank you. Galatasaray forever. This is a present from Galatasaray fans who are playing Izmir, if I've understood correctly. OK, let's go. We're climbing up there. He's taking us up to the ridge. We're starting to get away from it all, which is great. We're getting to the remoter parts, but the state of the roads is unbelievable. There are beasts everywhere, the backs of large animals appearing out of the vegetation. They might be donkeys or cows or something like that. Thank you. <laughs> Good, Good luck. luck. Yalla. This way or that way? There. You have to be careful because these are environments where you might come across wild animals and untamed strays. This is it. Thank you. Here we go. Where are we? 
There's no one here. There's a puppy barking at me. This is crazy. And you've already got a studded collar. Generally, studded collars are worn by sheepdogs. There are several breeds here in Turkey. They're worn to protect the dogs from being bitten by wolves. The studs give them a slight advantage if they get into a fight. Hello. Welcome. Don't sit on that. It's wet. Oh, it's wet. Thank you. I can show you my cows. OK. Look, he keeps his cows in here. He's rearing a Turkish breed of cows. They are the colour of aurochs, which is an extinct breed of wild bull or cow that can be seen on the wall of the Lasco caves. These cows have black bodies with a brown line down their backs and very light, almost white muffles. That's a female. And they are at home in this rocky landscape. Look at them go, that's great. I arrive in Bursa on the legendary Silk Route, an ancient trade route that was gradually abandoned from the 15th century onwards. Back then, the silk was carried by camels, so I'm getting closer to my goal. But first, I'm curious to find out how a totally different animal was domesticated, the silkworm. These must be the cocoons. This is a cocoon woven by a silkworm, which is actually a caterpillar. Humans kill these caterpillars during their metamorphosis so they can take the silk from their cocoons. The first wild moths to be tamed were Bombyx mori moths from China. Silk has been produced by humans like this since 2700 BC. A single cocoon contains almost 1,300 meters of thread. It's funny. It looks like a mixture of tangled hair and pasta. Vermicelli. It's amazing. Like Spider-Man. Crazy. It's magnificent to think that an insect has produced this and that we have industrialized it. It's impressive, really impressive. Silk merchants would travel from Bursa to China with their caravans of camels. The route is known as the Silk Road. Without camels, which are strong, resistant animals, this would not have been possible. These are big camels. The place where trade was done was known as a caravanserai. You have to imagine stalls everywhere selling silks, spices and exotic animals. All sorts of stuff was sold here along the Silk Road. That's not bad. Let's see. Oh, yes, that's lovely. One meter of this costs 100 lira. OK, I'll have to barter him down a bit. One meter. One meter of that for 70 lira. Go on. It's for my mother. OK? OK. 70 it is. OK, great. 100% bursa silk. Bye, Bursa. Next stop, Focha, further south beyond the mountains, a port on the Aegean Sea. On my way, I'm greeted by livestock from various Turkish villages. The pastoral heritage is plain to see. There are sheep and goats everywhere. This goat is like a cuddly toy. <laughs> Turkeys answer back. The turkeys have got their own sofa. Bad luck. I've caught a female. There. Her girlfriends are coming to rescue the little captive.
Here I am in the region of Focha, once known for its seal colonies. I meet Burke here, my Turkish alter ego. I ask him if it's still possible to see seals. He tells me it is really hard as they are so rare. We'll go and look for them out at sea later on, but first he wants to show me his favorite spot where we can watch unusual birds. Oh, excellent. Oh yes, a pelican. It's a Dalmatian pelican, which is a very big pelican. Excellent. This is an Asian species called Kasaka. It has a red face. It's a shell duck, a cross between a duck and a goose. It is bright orange. The male has a thin black collar, and it makes a noise like this. It's like a bark. It's a sign that we're in Asia, because this bird is only rarely spotted in France. These are migrating birds, and they settle here in winter. OK. And then? What do we see here? There are sheep over there, beyond the swamps. And you can also see flamingos. Oh, yes. You can see sheep passing in front of the flamingos. I think there is a swampy area, possibly with brackish water, an estuary or a lagoon. And beyond that is the real wilderness. This is amazing. This is a shepherd with a flock of Turkish sheep being watched by a sort of kangal, which is the most typical sheepdog in Turkey. They come from Anatolia. This one is friendly. It's all right. He's not at all aggressive. Hello. Are there any camels here? No, the camels and the yoruks are on the other side of the mountains. Thank you. Do the youth of today still appreciate nature? Do they come and observe it? Not really. More often than not, they cause damage to it. OK. If we continue to treat nature like this, many species will disappear over time. So this paradise is living on borrowed time. Focha was once a Greek city. Sailors left from here to found cities around the Mediterranean, Ampurias in Spain, Malia in Italy, and Agda, Nice and Marseille, the Phocian city in France. They came from here. They were Greek, and the city was named Phocaia after Phoci, the ancient Greek word for seal. The locals still use the image of the seal, even though there are practically none left. I've now met two nutcases who are just as crazy about nature as I am, and I get the impression that they know where we're going. At any rate, I'm following them. For once, it's not me who's leading the way. I'm just going with the flow. Apparently, we're going to try and approach the entrance to the cave to check that there are no seals resting there. I'll have a bird's eye view if a seal does come out of there. There are none here. Let's go. It's hardly surprising that there are no seals here. There are virtually none left in Focha. Hunting them has significantly reduced numbers, and intensive fishing and mass tourism have wiped out the rest. As a consolation for not seeing any seals, he's brought me to this uninhabited island, which is a favorite haunt for seabirds and rabbits, apparently. I'd like to see if the rabbits are the same here as back home. This outing has been a bit of a letdown. I failed to see a single living rabbit. 
All I find is a skull and a dead body. Apparently, Shehun is being followed by a pelican. He has just called us to say, come and see, I'm being followed by a pelican. He's calling it like a dog, and it's following him. Nature is so rewarding. We may not have seen any seals, but while we were looking for rabbits, we were joined by a pelican. I'm continuing on my way because I'm headed for the land of the camels. Hundreds of kilometers later, I finally reach my destination, Selchuk, the home of camel wrestling. I'm here to meet Hamdi, the man Sergil found for me. He drives camels like generations of his ancestors before him. He belongs to the ancient tribe of Yorok nomads, whose lives still revolve around camels today. This famous camel wrestling match takes place in two days' time. Hamdi and his protege will be taking part. It's time for the legend to become a reality. Do you have a camel? Just one. And how much does your camel weigh? A ton. <laughs> Like, like a, a car. car? Yes, he's very big. Apparently he's enormous. There are several weight categories and my camel fights in the heavyweight category. Thank you. Is he here? Where have they put him? Incredible. This is crazy. He's a heavyweight, all right. He's huge. He has legs the size of an elephant. Unbelievable. This position means He's ready to I'm fight? ready to fight. He wants to go out because he thinks the fight is on. He wants to fight. I can just imagine two titans like that in the ring, two gladiators facing one another, two tons of muscles and bones. That's great. Gulech Bey, that's his name. Crazy. On the camel's bum, you can't miss it. The whole family is gathered around the camel. It's crazy. This is their pet. That giant, cuddly toy. Okay, Gulech. Right. I'm going to leave him to calm down a bit. This is an example of what is known as immersion. You take a camel into your home and rear it. It's a bit like getting a puppy. The animal needs contact with a social unit. Being such sociable animals, camels relate well to humans. That's why they're good with children, and they grow attached to their owners. Back in the day, my Yuruk ancestors used camels to transport their goods. They traveled with their sheep and slept in tents. Camels were used as a means of transport. Right, so the camel is really central to the culture of Yuruks, these former nomads who are today more or less settled but have retained a love for this animal, which was once essential to their transhuman lifestyle. In short, it was their vehicle. Just as nowadays, some people love their motorbikes or their cars, back then, people loved their camels. Yes! This is gozleme. It's a sort of stuffed flatbread. It tastes so good. Iran is a type of drinking yogurt. It's delicious with a bit of cream on top. Nothing beats keeping animals. They are our friends and companions. For us, keeping animals is a passion. This weekend, people will come from all over to watch the camel fight. From Antalya, Chenakale, the Aegean coast, and from Bodrum. So everyone will be here. 
Hamdi is phoning a friend who also has a camel who wants to show us something. I'm not too sure what. Stay put. I'm coming over with some friends to film your camels. Unbelievable. He's saying, calm down, calm down, son. These are their children. His camel picked him up by the leg once and lifted him two and a half meters into the air. He shouted, let go, and the camel let him go. What have I let myself in for? It must be worth a fortune. They say it costs at least 20,000 to 25,000 euros to bring a camel over from Iran or Afghanistan. But a real champion can cost up to 100,000 or 200,000 euros. They're obviously highly rated if they've won a lot of fights, like this one here. Everyone here has a camel in the garage. This is the land of camel drivers. This one is a champion in the national top 10. Never mount a wrestling camel or it will kill you. It's urinating on its tail. That's to diffuse its scent while it's rutting. Incredible. Look at the beef on him. This thing weighs a ton. I've never seen anything like it. He's going to injure himself. Ah, the female is much smaller. This one looks more like a dromedary. She nearly bit my ear off. What's amazing about these big camels is that they amble. In other words, they put both left feet forward at the same time and then both right feet. Hamdi's friend has left me to take his female dromedary for a walk. In summer, the camels roam freely on the hillsides. They are only kept inside and separated while they are rutting because they get so aggressive with one another. They would kill one another for a female. The last visit of the day is to a camel driver who has a real treasure trove of more than 20 camels. The best have been in training during the autumn months and are now ready for the fight. Have you got a secret for getting your camel to win the fight? Our camels get only the best. Their food comes from lots of different regions in Turkey. Can you tell me whether the camel drivers use forbidden substances to make their camels perform better? Like the best camels. Camels are disqualified for doping offences. So the camels are dope tested? You're a butcher. Do you ever make camel sausages? When they're too old or they're not fighting, we turn them into sausages. But the clever ones fight to avoid ending up as sausages. We should get a bird's eye view of the camel procession, which is likely to pass by here. This is a chance to show off the contestants. It's a tradition on the eve of the fight. Among the Roman ruins of Selchuk, I can't help thinking of all the great men in history who made camels their best allies. Alexander the Great, Darius, Hannibal, Domesticated over 4,500 years ago, camels and dromedaries were used for transport, but also as mounts for soldiers to frighten the enemy. There is a long tradition among Turkish camel drivers of importing wrestling camels from Iran and Afghanistan, but not just any camels. These camels are a cross between a dromedary and a camel, producing these enormous first-generation hybrids, which are incredibly strong, with some weighing over a ton. The youngest camel driver. Now I'm a real yuruk. This is camel sausage, or suchuk, being cooked. The locals glorify camels, but if they're not good for fighting, if they're cowardly and run away, or if they're too old, they're turned into sausages. I'm leaving the procession to head for one of the few camel wrestling farms in Turkey. This is the only place in the whole region where I can see a young camel. I'm going to see how this famous cross between dromedaries and two humped camels is bred. This is the two humped male, a Bactrian camel from Asia, which is being crossed with a dromedary female from Arabia. The two species are genetically very close. I am right at the source here. 
I didn't realize they did this in Turkey. All the camels reared here are hybrids or future wrestling camels. The dromedary females must live here too. The young hybrid camel is stronger than his parents. He will grow up to weigh 1,000 to 1,200 kilograms. This has been a tradition for 300 years in Turkey. It doesn't exist anywhere else in the world. Right, so it's a Yuruk tradition. It is typically Yuruk. Here, we train camels like footballers. We make them do exercises so that one day they can fight in a ring. Okay. People think camels carry water in their humps. In fact, it is not water, but fat. It is a potential source of water since the metabolism can turn fat into water but it's not liquid water, it is fat which contains. It's incredibly soft, it's moving around. Let's go. It's actually really nice. Thank you for everything. Good luck. Bye. My friend Hamdi has offered me a bed for the night. They're preparing for tomorrow's fight. I can't wait to go to sleep and get up to prepare for the fight. Ah, so this is what life with the Yoruks is like. Camel wrestling. Hamdi, Mahaba. Hello. How are you? Have a seat. We crossed maybe. I have seen over 25 camels, and none of them is as heavy as Gulich. When Gulich enters the ring, he will be covered in white spittle. And he'll say, I am the strongest. Tomorrow, he will enter the ring like that. He will charge at his opponent and knock him down with one blow. Amazing. It's going to be incredible to watch. The granddaughter watches videos of camel wrestling on a loop. That's her thing. Instead of watching cartoons, she watches camel wrestling. Hamdi, tomorrow he's going to win. It's going to be OK. Is it important for your family to carry on the Yorick tradition of keeping camels? We used to be true nomads. We travelled everywhere with our camels and our goats. But that was in a, in a former life. We were nomads. We had our goats. We made our own yogurts. And we knew how to live. Right. I have a big family. Good. Good. Wow, amazing. What's this? What is it? Chorba. Ah, chorba, of course. Rice and grilled meat. It only just fits through the door. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> He's playing the drums. If he drinks too much raki, which is the local aniseed drink, he gets a beating from his wife. <laughs> uh, that portion is for the dog. <laughs> he almost cut the cat's head off. Hamdi does me the honor of taking me to the hill where his ancestors settled. I'm starting to feel a real affinity for these Yoruks and their values, which are based on a deep respect for nature and a sense of belonging to a world that is free and colorful. My ancestors climbed this hill and chose our village. I see. My family has lived here ever since. 
I hope my children will stay here, but if they leave, that's their destiny. Thank you. This is just a quick visit before bedtime. Everyone has come to give him an order. It's as if they've all come to wish him good luck. That's how I see it anyway. Get up! This is great. We're going to sleep. Yes, you're right. We must rest. Come on. The moon is bright, so there aren't many clouds. That means it shouldn't rain tomorrow, so the festival should go ahead. I hope the festival will go ahead. Apparently, it's a bit overcast and quite windy. They often cancel it if the threat of rain is too great. I think even he is wondering what will happen. Will it go ahead or not? Will we be going or not? Is the fight going ahead? It's been cancelled. OK, so it's been cancelled. Right. Cancelled. The fight's off. We thought it might be cancelled at the last moment. A storm might be brewing, so they've decided to cancel the festival. It's a bit of a blow for me, obviously. I wanted to see the camels wrestling, but it seems I'm out of luck. But the matter doesn't rest there. Hamdi and the other camel drivers have been training their camels for months, and some have travelled far and wide. Tomorrow, there will be a camel fight in Selemi, 100 kilometres from here and the forecast is good. We are in Selimyi. We traveled overnight with the camels. The final preparations are underway before the walk to the ring, a few kilometers away. These are like sumos or super tankers. Gulech Bay is over there. I recognize him. He is super excited. These fabrics weigh a ton. Here we go. He's ready. And all this is apparently to stop him catching a cold. Personally, I don't believe it. Camels are built to resist the freezing temperatures in the deserts in Central Asia, so I don't believe that camels ever feel the cold. This is crazy. He's ready now. Gulech Bay. Wow, the Rolls Royce of camels. Magnificent. Mirrors, bells, armbands. It's funny, the gentleness emanating from him. And also the pride he shows as he walks along, all dressed up like this. 21st century Yorick, a mobile phone in his left hand and a camel in his right hand. We're here. More than 5,000 people have come to watch this camel fight. The tension is mounting. It's palpable. 120 camels have come here to fight. Hamdi has been waiting a whole year for this moment. I've just met Gulech Bey's opponent. He's called Kidonia. I was feeling quite smug, thinking Gulech Bey was bound to win. I wasn't expecting to find another warrior like him. It should be a good fight. Good luck! In the wild during the rutting season, male camels fight to attract the attention of females. 
and they can get badly hurt. The Ottoman Empire made fighting camels the spearhead of its army. Now the Yoruks have made a spectacle of them, holding a big festival in their honor. The rules of the fight are simple. Camels can use their necks, legs, heads, and entire body weight to overcome their opponent. The fight is over when the referees appoint a winner or when one or the two sides decides to withdraw. No biting or low blows allowed. Only noble and recognized gestures or techniques, which the camel drivers have been teaching. These include twisting, side thrusts, neck locks, and tripping up. Each has their own speciality and weaknesses, which the opponent inevitably exploits. Soon, it will be Gulech Bey's turn. I feel as if I'm part of the family. I'm just as stressed as they are. The Gulech is warm now. This is the warm-up. He's doing press-ups. That's great. It's all part of the ritual. The camel is spreading its secretion on the ground. It's spreading its scent. Time to take off the muzzle. All that remains are these little ropes. We're heading into the ring. Careful, careful, careful. That's it. Push, Gulech. Push. Go, Gulech. Go, Gulech. He's biting his leg. He's making his leg bleed. Go, Gulech. That's it. Go, Gulech. Shit. His leg has come over the top. He mustn't fall. If he falls, we've had it. He's got his leg over the other camel's neck there. He could fall on top of us at any minute now. He could collapse. Go, Gulech. Get his leg off. Come on. He needs to flatten him. He needs to flatten him. Go, Gulech. That's it. Go, Gulech. Go, Gulech. Go. And the winner is Gulech Bay. Cool. The referee has announced Gulech Bay as the winner because the other camel has pulled out. Gulech fought well. He tried to get his opponent in a leg hold, but he got stuck. Luckily, he managed to get out of it. That could have been a catastrophe. They're not ecstatic because although it's a victory for Gulech, they got such a fright that they're still in shock. I understand. He nearly hurt himself. He got his leg over, and if he had turned around, he could have broken his vertebrae. That must happen in the wild, but they want to avoid that. It's still a victory for them. Someone's got something to say. Oh, I've been baptized. For anyone coming into contact with them, animals are more than simply companions. They are a reason for living and breathing, a link with nature which makes us feel alive. It is time for me to move on to other lands and other skies like a carrier pigeon or a caravan of camels on the move, to discover other amazing connections which have been passed on through the ages.